So this is not going to be a make your head explode talk um, about the really deep dark internals just because it'll be boring and I don't really understand what's going on. So the idea is to make to sort of show you where the code is, explain kind of what's going on, and probably tell some war stories about what happened. For those who don't know, about 20 months ago or so, I got really fed up with um, what was going on in Django's query construction code, which worked pretty well. In retrospect, worked surprisingly well for what it did, but it had a, it had a bunch of problems that we bumped into all the time, um, and it had a bunch of things that you just worked around. And so we, I decided to rewrite it, and it took a lot longer than I thought, and I rewrote it about three times, and the final version is now what's in Django 1.0 and pretty much works. But it's a little bit scary. So this is sort of a, a technical what's going on there without showing too much code. Um, before I start, I should sort of point out what the, at least what my belief is about where I'm going here. We've got this thing, Django, that is basically something we use to to work with Python objects. It's a bunch of tools so that we can create objects, we can display them on the screen, we can do HTTP request response. Um, and as part of this, it sort of naturally falls out that you want to be able to save stuff because you'd like to use it again. Um, what Django, what, what we aren't doing here is saying you must save stuff to a database. We're completely replacing SQL because SQL is too hard or anything foolish like that. That's kind of pointless. There's a good language for talking to relational data stores. It's called SQL. It works well. Um, we might as well not do that. We're trying to be a Python layer on top of this. Um, and the sort of saving thing just happens as a, as a byproduct that you have to, there's leaky abstractions going on. You can't not know that your data is going into a, into a database because the idea here is you've got, you've got models, models have attributes, the attributes can be complex objects themselves, they can have attributes and it's turtles all the way down. But when you go and put that into a database, it's just flat rows of data basically tuples in a set. And so you have to somehow unwrap all these nested objects and turn them into tuples. So you have to kind of understand there's a relational database underneath. But it's not required to be a relational database. It just happens that we're using that at the moment. But as Jacob mentioned at lunchtime, we've, we're pretty close to actually being able to work out of the box on non-relational databases. And the problems that Guido mentioned this morning that Django assumes you've got SQL is just I haven't yet got around to removing the last little bits of SQL. That might no longer be true by like tomorrow afternoon. Um, it's that close that it's really just, I need a reason, and we've got 1.0 out now, I have a little more time. So the overlap sort of looks like this. I just want to really drive home. We're not, the idea here is there's a lot of people who sort of go, I'd really like to get this in because I can do this in SQL and I can't do it in Django. Well, yes, you can, because you can talk to SQL. You can talk to the database directly with Django. Like all good statistics, these numbers are completely made up, right? <laughs> But that's kind of the, the goal we're after, sort of four to one, six to one type of, we, we're getting most of the stuff you don't have to worry about. Every now and again, you do have to dive in and just write some SQL, use a database cursor, and talk to the database. Of course, if you're not talking to a database, if you're talking to CouchDB or Hadoop or Bigtable or using GQL or whatever, replace cursor.execute with appropriate function. And we haven't reinvented the wheel there either. When you're talking to the database, you literally get, we give you back a cursor that is a normal Python DB API compatible cursor object. We've wrapped it a little bit because of things like Unicode handling, but, um, and putting in debugging, logging, and stuff like that. But it's essentially underneath, we're just doing what um, the normal Python database MySQL DB or PsychoPG or PsychoPG2 or SQLite 3 does. So if you're wondering what's going on there, PEP249 is the place to read. There's nothing that Django does that isn't in there at the absolute raw level. And that's pretty much it for the raw database level for this talk. So got that out of the way. We're now talking about what, does, what really happens as far as Django converting, dealing with the data from the Python layer and pushing it down so that it's appropriate to put into the database or replace database with favorite storage method here. There's a, basically three places that, you're in, that are interesting. And this talk is kind of to give people an idea. I'm not going to show a lot of code, but it's to give you an idea of where to look if you're actually interested in what the code's about. So DangoDB models query.py is where the query set class lives. This is the query set that you read about in the documentation. It's not a badly organized class in terms of things are actually labeled. These are the public methods. These are internal methods. It's still a long file. 
Remember, this has been refactored, which meant I added 200 lines of code to it, I think. And I moved about 6,000 lines somewhere else. So something went horribly wrong in the simplifying the code area. But that's the public API. And that's the, if you were re-implementing an entirely different back, back end storage, you probably wouldn't touch that class, unless you were, say, Google App Engine. But you, you really you should implement that API. DB models SQL slash everything under there is the deep dark internals. That's the, the portion that takes the public API and actually turns it into SQL. It doesn't know anything about databases particularly. It knows about SQL. So it's actually very database agnostic. I think there's two lines of code in there that actually test for specific database backend features. And that's because we were running out of time coming up to 1.0 and actually have to test for a couple of things. We will fix it better later on. Because I really want to keep all knowledge of databases out of there. One reason being that you can actually use the code in there to just generate the SQL. And talking to the database is done somewhere else. So you can actually replace how you talk to the database. Finally, we've got the actually talking to the database, which is managing connection to the database, uh, creating a cursors over those connections. Like, Think about, if you're not familiar with what's going on here, you make a connection to the database over a network, or possibly over a Unix socket or whatever. You have a connection to the database. You then have what are called cursors, which are essentially an operation talking to the database, be it a, an execute operation or a select pulling back rows. So when you execute a select, that's one statement to say, do this select. And then there's the operation of actually reading the data. So there's a two-way pipe going on there. In theory, you can have a couple of these things in flight at the same time. In practice, not so much. A lot of databases, at least the database wrappers, don't seem to like that happening. So we have to avoid that sometimes. But DB backend slash star, which is star here is disguising about 10,000 lines of code. That's where all of our database backends live. The SQLite one, two versions of the Postgres one, heaven help us. MySQL one and the Oracle one. It's also sort of, there's actually probably still a directory in there called dummy, which is kind of the interface for if you're writing your own external database API, although I'd really be looking at something like the Postgres version or the SQLite version if I was writing an external one. And people have written external ones. There, um, there's an MS SQL backend that pretty much just works out of the box with no changes to core, which is model and things in DB backends star. What bit goes into, let's, let's, again, we're still working in Python here. So these are, what, what's going into a sort of standard type of model, model thing here. And I really don't care what the blog model is, although feel free to think of it as, say, a web log. We've got the model. On every model, we have things called managers, which the default one is called objects if you do nothing, but you can define your own. You don't have to have an, an, um, a manager called objects. There's a little bit of a non-Pythonic thing in, in managers um, where the very first one you declare becomes the default. It's called, sort of a rare case where the first attribute, even though they're not named the same things, has special, special value. But life's like that in the big city. It works. But a manager is, is the thing attached to a model that basically gives you the interaction to talk to the query set. And we'll talk about it in a minute what else you can do with managers. And then we've got a whole bunch of query set methods, that you can, uh, like filters, excludes, counts, limits, what have you. And managers tend to proxy all of those methods as well. So everything that's available on a query set is usually available on the manager. Let's just say we're all talking the same, the same language here. Managers, aside from being a sort of interface to a query set, are a good place to put methods that act on, act on the model object itself. And again, the leaky abstraction thing here means you can think about this as these are methods that act on the whole table at once at the database level. If I'm writing a method that does something to all of my web logs in that table or all of my entries in it for an entry model or all of my stories in a story model, that's kind of a manager method. It doesn't act on one particular instance of these guys. It acts on the whole table at once. Or at the Python level, it acts on the t it's, it's something relevant to the type of model, not to a particular instance of the model. And so managers are kind of a good place to put that. More importantly for our purposes is they're, like I said, they're the thing attached to the model that really proxies for the query set. They're the entry to the query set. And they have a method called getQuerySet that, amazingly enough, gets you back a query set. 
or a subclass of a query set. Again, everything here is good Python behavior, everything's subclassable. So you can override get query set and return whatever you like. If you're talking to something that doesn't really, shouldn't really be using a query set, should be using something else, it can return whatever else. And later on, I'll get into where the right point might be to subclass that. But essentially, get query set is the thing to return. By default, it returns query set.all equivalently. So then you can just, you get back a query set. Query sets themselves are the things that hold filters, excludes, limits, counts, you name it. Every time you call a method on a query set, it makes a copy of itself and returns you this copy. So it's sort of chained method calling with the idea that you can stop at any point in the chain and use that copy again later to do something else. So you might have the initial portion of a, a set of filters, like filter on thing A, filter on thing B, and then you want to use that in two different ways. At one point, you want to then do a count on that query set, and another point, you want to keep doing some more filters. And you can happily just apply them to the first guy, because every time you call a method, you get a new instance back. That's the good part of that chaining, is you get a new copy back every time, so it doesn't change a reference you got. The bad part of this is every time you call a method, we have to make a copy. And there's a little, there's a few data structures underneath there that have to be copied every single time. I've heard at least one person at this conference tell me they're actually down to counting the number of clones of query sets as a way of um, optimi sort of keeping a handle on how much time things take. Because basically duplicating an object in Python and copying over about a billion attributes and deep data structures is not zero amount of time. It shows up in the profiles. Um, not enough to ever make me say don't keep calling methods on query sets, but if you find yourself doing a loop where you add a filter to the same query set and the loop is over 100 items, you may want to rethink the plan there. You're doing 100 copies of the item every time. So, all right, in pictures, what I just said. Every, every time you call a filter, you get back a different query set. We could stop after the public equals true here, save that to a variable, call the second filter on it, go back to the first, the first variable and call a different filter on it, and we're still going to get consistent results every time. The second filter doesn't change the thing returned after the first filter. Inside the query set, so remember the query set here is the, is the public API. Below that, everything I say now is absolutely 100% true. It's also 100% not public API. So feel free to explore, feel free to use this, feel free to write code that depends on this, feel free not to complain if it changes. Um, it's, it's internal, but it's, it's relatively sane internal stuff. Inside the query set, we now have to turn everything into SQL or something that talks to CouchDB or something that talks to what have you. So every, mo every method on a query set, really all it's responsible for doing is calling appropriate methods on this query object, which holds the current state of what our query looks like in some sort of anonymous fashion, and pokes at the right things to change it to get a new state. And every time we clone a query set, we're also cloning the query attribute of that query set. And that's what actually takes so much time in cloning. We, um, it's actually the query object that is the data structure from hell here. Jacob Kaplan-Moss told me at one point it looks like a CS101 class in there. I think I've used every data structure he's heard of and a couple that he hasn't. So there, there literally is there's sets, dictionaries, trees, flattened trees, <laughs> tuples, lists, and there's a difference between the tuples and the list. It, it's a little bit messy, I agree, but they all have good reasons. And it's the query class that knows how to produce the SQL at the end of the day. But it doesn't produce the SQL as it goes along. It, it actually stores the data in a nice, sensible fashion. And only at the end of the day, when you really need it, like there's a, basically an as SQL method, only when you call that does it, produce, does it put everything together and call the SQL. And this is something that's an improvement in the, in the query set refactor code. The original 0.96 query code basically work with strings. Every time you called a filter, it worked out, ah, I need to add this fragment of the string to the query. And that worked pretty well until you needed to go back and add extra from tables, extra join tables, or you needed to make a subquery. And so you need to take tables out of your existing one and put them into a subquery. And the wheels fell off pretty badly at that point. So we switched to using more Pythonic data structures internally and only right at the very end turning into SQL. And this is also how we can handle pushing all of the database specific stuff down to Django DB backends, because we write very, very portable SQL. And if something, for example, Oracle or MS SQL Server needs to write different SQL, 
they can subclass or wrap the query class and just replace the asSQL method. They've still got access to the full data structure here. Um, and all they have to do is replace one method. Like, the Oracle backend is a very good example here. Um, MySQL, Postgres, SQLite have all implemented limit and offset in their SQL dialect. It's not part of SQL 92. Oracle has not. There's a different way to do limits and offsets in, um, in Oracle. All the Oracle guys had to do, I say all in that it took us a while to get this right, but all the Oracle guys had to do was write a different as SQL that took the existing query, it's a subclass of query, takes the existing data structures, turns it around a little bit, and produces the right string out the back that Oracle can understand. That's database specific. It's in Django DB backends Oracle slash query.py, but it, they're not actually doing it. It's only probably 20 lines or 25 lines of actual functional code changes in there. It's, it was kind of very nice when we did the Oracle port for the query set refactor. I should point out, just because I want to embarrass him with this, Justin Braun sent me the Oracle port of query set refactor. I've been putting it off for ages and ages because it was really going to be unpleasant and I didn't like working with Oracle. Justin needed a break from studying for a law exam, and so he did the Oracle port of query set refactor and sent it to me, and it just worked. So thank you, Justin, You're sitting up the back there somewhere. <laughs> it, it just worked. I didn't have to actually reinstall Oracle to make that work. <laughs> Easiest Oracle port I've ever done. Going between, this is kind of important for me. I don't know. I'm a data structure guy when I'm doing complex code like this. I sort of think about how do, how do the data structures move around in this code, because it's not really, the algorithms aren't particularly hard, he says, and there's 7,000 lines of code in there. But it's really all about data structure manipulation in there. The barrier between query set and query is kind of the key one here, because if you were going to replace query, if you were going to replace the back end, you probably, if you're me, wanting to replace query, not wanting to replace query set. Unfortunately, it's a little bit of a crafty barrier at the moment. That's sort of why I issue the warning that feel free not to complain if it changes, because I might try and clean that up. In that every th time you call something on query set, it's poking at query. It's, it's calling methods on queries. I made sure that it's not actually poking at the internal structure of the query class. But it's not very clear if you're reading the code, particularly if you're re reading the query class, is this method I'm reading something that query set or something external is using to adjust the state of query, or is it an internal method on query? And I do need to kind of go through and say this is, this is internal internal, and this is external internal in terms of query set talks to query and says this. But if you were going to, if you were going to replace, like if you were going to write something that spat out GQL, Google's query language instead of SQL, you could actually do it by replacing the query class. And then you're only doomed when people use related fields. And like I said, that can be fixed. The data flow back the other way, which is necessary because we talk to the database and we kind of want to get our results back again, a save-only framework would not be quite so popular. Basically, it's one method. There's a results iterator, appropriately called results iterator, that is essentially wraps up the call to talk to the database, execute the query, pull the results back in an iterator fashion. However, because we also have to reconstruct, we give you back Python objects, not rows of data, and we reassemble um, relations, and we have select related, and all sorts of messy bits that make the nice story a lot more complicated. We, we also have to look at what related models have you talked about, and I'm kind of assuming everyone's familiar with Django's query language here, or you're probably in the wrong talk. But select related plays a role here. Extra select, which is where you can say, I also want to select these other, I want to select some extra bit of SQL fragment that I've passed in and call it Fred, or call it, call it Barney, and give it back to me as an attribute on the model. I've got to worry about those. All of those get poked into the query class just because it's somewhere to put them. I've got this big bag of, bag of data I'm hauling around everywhere. Let's put everything in there. And the query set has to read that data to know how to reconstruct these models. That's messy. I, like I, it, it smells bad in a way because I'm, I kind of don't want query set to have to read stuff out back out of query like that. But if I don't do that, I have to store the data in both places, and that also smells bad. So at some point, I just got sick of adding extra data structures here, so I shoved it all in query, and we can read it out. If you've lost track of what we're up to, this is, this is pretty much what goes on with a blog.objects.filter something. We talk to the manager, we get back a query set, and where it says query set here, as you'll see in a minute, we can think of any subset of query set. Query set has a little query attribute, which 
by default is initialized to be an empty query attribute. You, you can pass in a different query thing. This is how GeoDjango works, for example. It's continually passing in this thing called GeoQuery. And oh, when I did my survey where the code is before, I should definitely say Django slash contrib slash, what's he called it? GIS slash DB slash model slash SQL. Look in the GIS directory, <laughs> search for query.py, and there's a whole bunch of stuff here that shows how to extend existing query stuff. Because Justin's done it all the right way. And by the right way, I mean he kept sending me mail saying I need to be able to do this, and we added a hook. So he better use it. Um, <laughs> We have a query attribute, gives us the query object, which is internal. At some point, when we call results it, results it is responsible for calling execute and getting the data back. So if you're replacing how do I talk to the database, you replace the execute method. The execute method needs to know what do I actually do to talk to the database, calls the as SQL method, which gives you back the SQL string and the parameters. By the way, calling stir on a query object actually gives you the SQL string, except it doesn't escape the parameters correctly. So, because we don't know how the database backend escapes parameters. So you can't quite cut and paste, but it's very, very close for all sensible data. As SQL returns, obviously, the query string and the parameters. So it's pretty, it's pretty nice for debugging. As SQL was like the first method I wrote on a query class because you're just going to screw it up a lot, and you need to be able to see what's going on. So I use As SQL a lot. All right, that's the everything works perfectly version of my life. What happens when we want to do trickier things? And this isn't trivial. Like, I mean, this isn't irrelevant. Everyone knows we've got values, like the values function that returns a list of dictionaries. We've got now values list that returns a list of tuples. We've got date query sets. We've got GeoDjango that returns things with polygons and elephants and who knows what's in it. We've got, you can do any sort of customization you like. What goes where? Custom managers, I'm, I'm saying easy for this room, right? I mean. You can put whatever you like on custom managers. Customizing get query set to return blog entries that are only public is, OK, it's possible. Now I want to say, this is, this is my stage at the moment. Get query set returns you, if you've got a default manager on a class, get query set should actually return you something that's sensible as a default. If you're being too restrictive, all sorts of interesting things break in Django to the point where now the admin interface doesn't use your default manager because people just restrict it too much. It uses its own its own query object because you might be accidentally ruling things out. Try and be careful with your get query set on default managers because people are restricting them a bit too much. They're confusing, well, I'm going to say confusing, in my opinion, default with stuff I, I want to use commonly. But default should really be the, the good set to have as a default. Changing the query set is much more interesting. Write a manager that returns a different sort of query set. Here's a whole bunch that come with Django. If you do a dates query, and hardly anyone uses dates queries, I gather. It sort of will only affect world online. You, you call, give me all the dates, blog.objects.filter based on public equals true dot dates. Gives you back a list of all the dates involved in this particular set, which is very useful if you're doing an archive sort of view or anything like that. It returns a special query set called the date query set. And date query set will play a role in a minute. Values query set is a, is a special type of query set that says, I don't need to get back every, I do a normal query, but then when I'm constructing the results to return back to the user, instead of creating model objects, which is something that the query set does, instead create dictionaries and like pair up these rows of values I'm getting back with the names of the fields, turn it into a dictionary, shove all those into a list, and give them back. There's also values list query set, which just didn't have room on the slide, and that's Again, a, a simplified version of values query set. Empty query set, surprisingly enough, is, is always empty. It's every now and again, you want to pass around the equivalent of none, but have it be a query set so that you can call query set methods on it. You, can, you, you are using a generic view that wants a query set as its values, but you know you're not going to have anything there. So you actually go blog.objects. I don't know what we call it, none or empty or something. Shows how often I use it. There's a method on managers that returns you an empty query set. <laughs> and there's, there's the same method exists on query sets. So you can always basically get the equivalent of none and, and get back an empty query set that will always remain empty. You can also change the query object underneath. Different backends. I keep going on and on about this one, but different styles of queries. For example, as Justin will probably point out in the next talk here, 
Geo Django has to do quite a different style of query. So they, the reason you need a different query set there is because you need a different query. It, it's a little bit of a problem. If you want to replace the query class, and by problem I mean not a big hassle, you just have to think about it. If you want to replace the query class because you want to talk to a database in a different way, you want to talk to MySQL over HTTP, for example, you actually have to replace the manager. So the manager can return you a different query set, and the query set can return you a different query. You can't quite say change the default query. Tough. It's, you don't have to do it so infrequently, it's not really a big deal. And if someone comes up with a good API, we can fix that. I'm responsible for the plumbing department. I give the means so that we can then come up with a good API later on and expose it to the public if we need to. Date query set is a very good example of this because we're trying to select all of the dates that would be affected by this filter. And, and an SQL query is essentially a set, of, a set of sets, like a set of results that we're filtering and filtering and filtering, gradually restricting results for. For a date query set, we don't need all the columns that you would normally give back. We don't need any of these extra things that you asked us about, possibly. When you call dates, all we need is a particular date function call. So we completely, the date query is the normal query thing, except it throws away all of the select columns that it would normally be using and just asks for a particular date thing. There's also a count query that if you, if you call counts on a query set, it, give, it uses a special query because again, counts are kind of special, particularly count in conjunction with distinct. There's a bit of a wrinkle there because Postgres and SQLite and I think Oracle, maybe not Oracle, Postgres and SQLite, can't just do count distinct on multiple columns. So there's a bit of a, if I would normally need multiple columns, I may have to do a nested query, and it got messy, and it became its own query class. But you can have a look at that. It's not actually that complicated, though, once you start dealing with the right data structure. I already have the right query object here. I just have to change the columns. So I just change as SQL. All right. Diving a little deeper inside this query object, which is this magic bag of, it's the state of the world for a query set. It's everything, what columns have I asked you to select for me? And if I haven't asked you any, it knows the difference between I've asked you to select all columns and I haven't told you anything about the columns, which will eventually, if you do nothing special, will come out to be the default all columns. But there's a difference between explicitly asking for all columns and possibly wanting all columns if I don't tell you anything else in the middle. Um, it understands what tables you've asked for, what, what filters you've asked for, and things like this. Let's have a little bit of a look at what's going on inside there. Wow, this disguises no end of code. When you call filter on a query set, <laughs> and again, think of this as blog.objects.filter blog author equals user. We end up calling the filter the filter function here. This was something that kind of impressed me when I started using Django, was they managed to get this kind of filter language that looked pretty readable. It used double underscores a lot, but it was valid Python. That was, it actually took a little while to wrap my head around why this even worked. <laughs> but it was the first bit of code I went in and read. It was like, how on earth does filter work? It's keyword args. It's, you get a dictionary of um, author underscore underscore name is the argument equals Fred as the value. So we call the filter thing. Filter wraps everything up into what are called queue objects. There is, a, there is in Django DB models, there's a, an object called queue, which is, I guess, short for query. It has historical relevance somewhere. But it essentially wraps up keyword value pairs. You can construct queue arguments on your own and all them together and add them together and take the negation of them and stuff like that. That's something that's become a bit more functional lately. You can actually do tilde q to get the negation of a particular filter. In any case, the filter command wraps everything up into q objects, whether you pass it in as keyword arguments or whether you pass it in q objects. It wraps everything up into one big q object that's a tree, where the, the internal nodes of the tree are ands or ors, and then the, the leaves are, are, are child nodes, are sort of name value pairs usually, or possibly complicated geo Django things, or possibly functions that run off and get data from somewhere else. It then calls the addQ method inside the query class. And addQ, amazingly enough, adds a Q object to, the, to the, the thing. And a Q object here could be, again, a Q object is a tree. So it's not just a simple object. It actually has a whole hierarchy to it. So this is a, a bit of a recursive mess. If you actually look inside that function, it's doing more than one thing. It's descending through the standard Q object tree 
but it's also kind of the common entry point. If you want to write your own queue-like objects, it, it says, oh, do you have something called as SQL on your object? If you do, I'll call that instead. And I'll give you access to the query object so you can change it. You can basically do everything that Django's queue objects do in your own custom classes. In the normal case, though, we get a queue object, we call add queue, add queue loops through the tree, basically depth first walk through this tree of, of values that are anded and ordered together, and calls add filter on each of them. Add filter is sort of the guts. If you're trying to understand what query the query class did, starting at add filter isn't a bad way to go, providing you understand what it actually accepts. It takes one filter condition at a time, so sort of the entry's author's name is Malcolm. Even in a big, complicated join of ands and ors and stuff, it only gets one filter at a time. Add Q is responsible for breaking up the tree. It's still 100 lines of code, because there's a, it's responsible for turning that, doing all of the table joins that are responsible there, working out if do I need new tables, do all of that, put everything into the where clause, worry about whether things are negated or not and handling the negation properly, and well, at the end of the day, it, it then returns pretty much nothing except here are the extra tables I had to use for technical reasons. I've carefully not listed all of the parameters for add filter there because it takes like 11 of them. Most of them are because it gets called recursively internally and it needs, it needs to know the current state of play. But primarily, it takes a filter and it puts it into the, adjusts the query object sufficiently that it now knows how to, how to restrict based on that filter. The hard work of add filter is done by setup joins, which hopefully the name is self-explanatory. It takes a split up. We're using the same filter as before. It doesn't know anything about the value. Like the Malcolm here is irrelevant. It takes entry, author, and name, because all it needs to know is I need to join the table so that I can query the name object at the end. So it does, it's responsible for I know I'm here. I know I'm on my blog table. Essentially, I'm starting point in my blog table. I need to be able to walk down a hierarchy of tree joins to get to the author table and query the name field. However, we know, we know because we've named our field sensibly that name here is a, is a character field. But name could actually be a pointer to, a, to another model again, in which case we need to remember to match the ID to, to the other model's ID, or it could be a many-to-many, -many, or who knows what. But setup joins handles all of that. <coughs> it's... I keep occasionally getting patches from different people for different reasons to split up setup joins into it should just handle one table join at a time and be called recursively. And it used to do that. It used to do that in 0.96. There's a, thing, a function called lookup inner that was basically what setup joins has become. It's really, really slow. Like you spend a lot of your time in setup joins. Every time you do a filter, we're in setup joins going, do I need to join this table? Does it need to be an inner join or an outer join? Do I need to add a new table here? It's doing a lot of logic so that at the end of the day, the SQL query that we send to the database is as efficient as possible. We can't be 100% efficient because we don't know everything about your data set, but we can be very, very efficient. And we do that by, we pay the cost here of doing a lot of calculations. Having set up join actually being a loop instead of a set of nested function calls was something like a 5% saving in various common cases. It was quite amazing. At the end of the day, it, it says, I've done all the setup of the joins. Here's all the aliases that I used. Um, here's the final field object that we're pointing to, which is a Django DB models field object, so that then something higher up the chain can, set, can add that to the where clause and so on. And again, this is if you're wanting to read the code and wondering what you should look at. You start with that filter. You see, hey, it calls setup joins a lot. That's what setup joins does. That's worth having a read of. Join is the other method that's sort of worth paying attention to in query. It's responsible purely for joining a pair of tables. We have a, at any given moment in time, we have a list of tables with alias names and join conditions between them. This might be inner joins, it might be outer joins, um, it might be an inner join that could be promoted to an outer join because it's potentially, the, it's, it's null equals true on that join, but at the moment we don't, aren't including null values, but we could promote it if we needed to. And so we give it the alias we're joining against, in this kind, let's just call it T4, the, the new table that we're wanting to connect to, and the two columns on each side of that that we're joining. And so we want to turn it into something like this um, T4 in a join with the author table on a particular combination of columns. 
It might need to create a new alias here. We might not have seen this table before. We might have seen this table before, so we can just reuse it. It will return the old alias. We might have seen this table before, but connected to a different table. Think about a case where you've got, um, let's say you've got an author, mm, let's say you've got a person model, you've got a, a group model, and within the group model, you've got both a leader and members, and members could be many to many. Both the leader is a foreign key to person, and members is many to many to, to the person table. If I'm filtering against both of these fields, I need to use different copies of the person table because I'm getting a different row out for the leader as I am than I am for the members. So we sometimes have the same table popping up multiple times with different aliases, but sometimes we can reuse. You can probably imagine the amount of debugging that went into getting that right and being able to prove that it actually selected the right tables. I'm pretty confident now that there's no cases where we double up, although I think I only fixed the last bug on Tuesday. So it was, I was confident before Tuesday that I got the last bug out too. So take that for all it's worth. <laughs> At the end of the day, it returns what's the new name for the author table. If this is the first time we've seen the author table, it returns author. If we've seen the author table before, it gives it a new name, T some number. Unless we're using the T alias for a different query, in which case it's U or V or W. Like Again, we handle nested queries here, so we have to be careful about managing aliases. Quick run through, this is more the war story department. Quick run through things that were harder than they seemed at first sight. Like everything I've sort of talked about here is, you can see it might be a little bit complex, but really applying your brain to it, you basically get it, get it all out and things 80% work pretty quickly. Three times they 80% worked and I kept getting stuck. I tried a number of different data structures internally and I tried a relational algebra approach, I tried a much flatter data structure that's like 0.96, I came up with this sort of middle thing that pretty much worked. But one of the things that was a very early discovery that sort of motivated me to try to make all this work is, unless you're joining, Django 0.96 was very, very conservative. It only used inner joins. There are a few cases where it really should have used outer joins, but it didn't. And we tried switching that, and it, which meant you lost results occasionally. You didn't get certain rows that would have been selected if you'd used the proper outer join. Um, and then people kept posting patches saying, I've got this case, and if we promoted this to an outer join, we get all the results, and it would still be right if we only needed an inner join. And yes, it would still be right. It would also be slower and significantly, like outer joins are more expensive than inner joins. Unless we know, we can work out when we need an outer join. If, there's, if we're comparing um, entry underscore underscore author underscore underscore name equals Fred, there's absolutely no chance of needing to match a null row or, on the author table because we're only matching against names that have a value of Fred and Fred is not null. So we can completely avoid any outer joins in that even if some of them are potentially nullable. And so the internal code knows inner join, inner join, inner join, inner join. If any of them have null equals true, it knows later on if I need to, I can promote this to an outer join but right now I don't need to. So you'll find that even things that are null equals true are inner joins if we don't need them to be outer joins and are outer joins if we're comparing to nulls. Or in excludes, they often become outer joins. Aliases, I've already talked about, you don't want to have collisions. Sometimes you want the same table with different names. More trickily, when you are merging two different query sets, you'll have T1, T2, T3 over here, and similarly over here, except they'll point to different, they'll point to different tables. Generally not a good idea. Actually, point nine six had a lot of very fun bugs like this where you'd merge two query sets that were almost the same but not quite, and you'd get kind of funny results out if you really paid attention because it would just, there'd just be collisions between the aliases. So we're, we're pretty careful to relabel aliases, and that's, there's a lot of code in there. If you have a look, there's um, functions called things like relabel aliases and bump aliases. As was, I was getting really desperate for names at that point, which basically says all of, the t, all of these T1, T2, T3s, call them U1, U2, U3s, because I, I need a completely orthogonal set of aliases. Oh, yeah. <laughs> many to many joins are so not my friend. <laughs> There were so many bugs in these. But many to many joins in a straightforward fashion that just work, right? There's a join table, you connect the, the value over here with its appropriate column in the middle table, you connect the value of the, of the other table to the right-hand side table. Sometimes you can optimize, optimize away the right-hand side table, it works perfectly. Then you start doing uh, things like the, the problem of, I wanna find all of the blog entries 
that have a tag which is both public and its parent's name is software. And think this is a tag model that has a parent foreign key to itself. Compare that with the, the second type of query. I want an entry that has tags that are public and a tag that, whose parent is software. The second case is actually saying potentially two different tags. One that's public, I at least have a tag that is public and a tag that is whose parent is software. The first one is saying I want the same tag that's both public and whose parent's name is software. Because query sets are restrictions on the first object. So these are always where we've got a set of entry objects. We start off with all entry objects, and we want to filter it down. So the logic here is, and it's a little bit tricky when you need to understand it, is every time I call a filter, it further restricts the set of entries. And the rule we sort of came up with, and it is documented, you couldn't do this previously. You, you had to choose one or the other. Django always chose the first style. Now you can do both. If you do a single filter call, they're all applied to the same table. If you do successive filter calls on many to many's, they potentially apply to different rows in that table. So that you can get both multiple tags matching multiple criteria or the same tag matching multiple criteria. Exclude with many to many was something that just didn't work before because it actually requires a nested select, which never happened. If you think about it, if I've got, I, I match, I filter on, exclude is the opposite of filter. So if I filter on tags that have public is true, if I'm excluding that, I want all, I want entries that do not have a tag where public is true. And you can't write that without doing a nested select. Like you end up with something like this, where the entry ID is not in the set of entry IDs that match this particular condition on tag. So there's a, there's a whole special case in the add filter method in queries for I'm matching a many to many, I'm in a negated branch, the negate flag is true, and it bails out to do a subselect at that point. I'd left exclude to right to the very end because I thought, uh, then I'll just have to go through and add a bunch of negation to things, turn ands into ors, and add a not out the front. About two weeks later, <laughs> I finally worked out and got, got all the bugs out of many to many's. <coughs> Ordering. <laughs> Yeah, you'd think this would be easy. It's sorting, right? You just do order by and join the tables. Then you remember that some of these could be nullable out of joint, nullable tables, so they actually require out of joins. That bug only got fixed a week and a half ago when someone actually pointed it out leading up to 1.0. There were a few other bugs in ordering that it really was a lot harder than it looked, partly because we've now allowed you to order by related models. You used to be able to technically do this in 0.96 by specifying the table name and the field attribute name which was a bit of a disconnect because one of them is a database sort of attribute and one of them is a, a Python attribute. So it's not even database name and database column name. It's database name and Python field name, Python attribute name. Now you just use the same syntax as for model, as for model filtering. You just do something like, I want to order on author underscore underscore name. So it, it's all purely Pythonic now. It doesn't care what your database is called. Select related became more complicated because I like pain. We went from select related of selecting everything to now in select related, you can say, I only want to select that, 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 and that, and this guy, I want you to go three levels deep. And this now allows you to do select related across nullable foreign keys. Um, there's a patching track that just didn't make the feature cut for 1.0 to do, allow you to do it backwards across one to ones. It got a lot harder because of that, I only want to allow restricted fields. We selected the right data all the time, but you tend to get back models that didn't really match anything like what you were expecting. It sort of put the arm on the left ear and things like that. It really was horrible for a while. Extra is my least favorite method in the world, Adrian. A way to insert random, opaque SQL fragments into your SQL. But I have no control over what you've written. All right, here's, here's the deal, guys. If you use extra, pretty much all bets are off when you start using other complicated things like merging query sets together and stuff like that. Because we can't, we're not going to write an SQL parser. We want this to sort of work even with non-SQL backends and stuff like that. Extra really are opaque bits of string that you're throwing into your query at the right moment. So if you're putting extra in, I'd probably say do it as the very last thing because there's almost, like, do it as the very last call to your query set. There's almost no way to screw that up at that point. You've sort of tested your query set up to there, and you go, and now I need this extra bit. But really, all bets are off if you start doing complicated things. Mostly, it just works. But if the wheels fall off, you get to keep all the bits, right? Don't file bugs, because we're not writing an SQL parser. Generic relations, is he here somewhere? Jacob's not here, right. 
generic relations and generic foreign keys were a little bit complicated to get right in the filtering stakes to the point where we actually only got the last bug out again two weeks ago, or actually probably just this week. It was one of the last showstoppers for 1.0. There were certain circumstances where you'd be, generic relations are these things where they're not a database level relation. We store the content type of the model we're relating to and the primary key value inside that model. So you can, for example, the comments module, you can add a comment to anything. So we store the type of object that the, this comment is attached to and the primary key value. In certain types of filtering backwards, so I have my blog and I want to work out blah, 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 work out all of the comments on this, we were only filtering on the comments that had the primary key value matching myself, not primary key value matching myself and content type matching myself. So you could get back all of the comments that had my primary key ID that were attached to that model over there. Fortunately, not a lot of people spotted this one. So I think this particular use case isn't as common as we, as we might think. But anyway, it's now fixed. It was a bear, but it's fixed. Soon, thank you, Google, as a summer of code project that Russell Keith McGee was actually mentoring and Nicola La Rosa from Italy was doing, we have um, aggregate support, essentially. Being able to do things like, on this model, what is the maximum value of the date field, or what is the average value of the, of the quantity field, or something like that. We're doing this at the Python level. Again, Django is a, is a set of tools for working with Python objects. So we're doing this at the level where it puts an attribute on your model saying, here is the maximum, here is the average, here is whatever. So we're not adding things like a group by function to query sets, because that's not, a, that's not a concept that makes sense at the Python level. It's the way it happens to work at the SQL level, group by and having. But these aren't things we need at the query set level. We actually need maximum, minimum, average, counts. There's another one. There's five. I can't remember what the fifth one is. There's five aggregate functions, basically, in SQL. And and this sort of lays the way for doing similar sorts of functions like that for arbitrary SQL callouts. That's not, I haven't actually been involved in that at all beyond reading the code occasionally just to check it, it hadn't gone way away from where I was expecting it to go. But I'm sure once we sort of start putting in features again for 1.1, that's very much on the timeline for going in. So that's a good piece of work that just didn't really make the 1.0 cut because it wasn't Google Summer of Code only just finished and we really didn't want to upset the apple cart so late in the process. If you're wanting to do anything here, extend new database backend, GeoDjango, any of these things, subclassing is very much the way to go. We've added hooks. We've added hooks for everything. We've allowed methods to be overridable. Um, particularly, we've allowed methods to be overridable. So if you have a look at have a look at the update query class, which is updating values in the database, it actually subclasses the query class, constructs a slightly different query internally, and has a different as SQL method but it still uses all of the join, add filter, all of this sort of jazz from the query class because we already know how to do that. Similarly, the delete query, well, delete's a little bit special, but again, it's still, the filtering construct can still be done by the query class. Just at the end of the day, you need to go delete from table where instead of select from table. There's almost no dependency on specific backends, um, on specific database backends in the query class. So providing you have something that talks SQL, it's pretty easy to have it talking to a different database or to a different talking, not necessarily using the Python DB wrapper. You only have to override the execute method because it's the execute method that goes, give me the Django DB connection dot cursor object and call cursor dot execute and then um, something else, and then it returns the iterator of results. So all you need is a method that returns an iterator over the results, however you happen to get those. You can load them out of a file. Certainly, I'd encourage you, if you're trying to do anything to customize the query class or the query set class, subclass. Don't do anything else, just subclass. <coughs> Inside the manager, you can change the query set. Inside the query set, you can, when you clone, like I said, every method on a query set returns a query set or a subclass. How do you think values works? We call the values method, it returns a query set subclass. It actually returns values query set. That's the sort of way it, it works. You can return a different type, a different subclass of a query set 
when you call a query set method. There's a clone method in query sets that controls this. Within the query set itself, or the subclass, you can change the type of query you're doing. This is how GeoDjango works. It uses a geo query everywhere. Consequently, it uses a geo query set that knows to create a geo query. Inside the query object, there's another attribute called the where class, which is controlling the filtering. What, what becomes the where clause in SQL? And I haven't gone into that much, but essentially it's a tree that stores a bunch of data so that we know how to make the where clause. It's not particularly interesting outside of an implementation detail because it really is just a tree of data that we happen to miraculously put together in the right order at the end of the day. But you can change the type of where clause if you're, for example, adding new lookup types or you need to add new converters so that you know how to construct this SQL where clause for different data types. Again, have a look at GeoDjango as a way this is done. That wouldn't be nearly as good as it was if it wasn't for Justin actually following along behind me in Query Set Refactor having a GeoDjango branch that actually worked um, following this branch and keep saying, I can't do this, I can't do this. I want to do this. Justin, your patch is disgusting. Let's do it a different way. And it became a lot better because of this. Ah, yes, soapbox time. Like I said, I'm responsible for the plumbing layer here. Like, there's lots of areas of Django I don't have my fingerprint. I, I have my fingerprints all over. But in this particular area, I'm, I'm the plumbing guy, right? I give us the way that we actually convert these Pythonic things into SQL. Public API is a lot harder than internals in some, like implementation of internals is hard, but the public API is harder than the internal API because it has to be right. You want people to be able to rely on it. You don't want it to change from release to release. Once we put a public API in there, we're basically saying until Django 2, it's pretty much going to work. So I can happily shovel in as much stuff as I like in private API, providing it doesn't sort of weigh things down. Um, but we, haven't, we don't necessarily have the porcelain layer. We don't necessarily have the, the tools that go on top of the plumbing here to make it usable. So for example, the d database connection is local to the query class. This means you can do multiple database support because you just have different query objects that point to, or you can poke at the database connection and point it somewhere else. There's no public API for doing that. You've got to poke at the internal API at the moment. One day we'll work out a proper public API for specifying all this, and it will use these hooks. Today, you can be experimenting and trying to work out what is a good public API. I know of two different companies who are using this sort of stuff in production. Because it's not hard. I, there's doc strings in there. The code sort of makes sense. But just be aware, there's a lot of stuff in there that at the moment doesn't have a public API, partly because we don't want to lock it down. We're trying to work out what's usable, what needs to be changed. On the other hand, there is a bunch of stuff that I wish I could do X. There's possibly already a hook in there or a way to get X out of it pretty quickly. Existing sort of plumbing details. And don't tell anyone, this is just between us, right? This, this is stuff that no one should really know about. Multiple database support is possible because the connection attribute is local. There's a little bit of extra we need there in the plumbing department, but it's pretty much good. There's one leaky pipe. You can write custom queue objects that do anything you like. All you have to do is write an add SQL method and accept a couple of parameters. You can add new lookup types. We can almost do nested we can do nested queries already. That we need that for exclude. You can almost do filtering on a query set, like um, author name in um, author dot objects dot filter whatever, and it will only do one query. That needs actually one one or three lines of code change somewhere. Again, I didn't want to destabilize 1.0 to get that in, but I've, I've actually got a branch that pretty much works there. Um, plumbing exists. It's not quite exposed yet. Mm, missing plumbing. Adding new lookup types, you're adding them globally. So you've got a bunch of code that says, if I'm not this guy, raise a type error or something. You end up having to write that. A few people have mailed me saying, I really want to do, I've worked out how to do adding lookup types, but I really want to just add it for this field. Yeah, I know. We'll, we'll do that at some point. There's a big oversight. You can't, when you call the where clause to add something to it, the where clause doesn't have any reference back to the query. So if it needs to add new tables, or promote joins or something like that, meh, it can't. So that's just a bug. It's internal API. We'll fix it. A couple of other options there, including hash generation, just key generation. I've used these filters in the query. I've used these columns because you might want to be able to cache things, object identity, stuff like that. Missing. Apart from that, I think it all kind of works. Hope this is giving you some insight. I'm done. Questions?
Do we have time? Oh, not you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, um, first one, I'll, I'll drop this in. You mentioned uh, aggregation and Nick LaRosa. Uh, that's ticket 3566 or something. Uh, the other piece of that puzzle, which Nick actually worked on, and again, is going to make me look really good when it gets committed, but he did all the work, uh, is ticket 7210, which is the ability to reference fields in a query as part of the query. So, for example, you can currently say, uh, give me all of the objects with a height equal to three or a height greater than three. You can't currently say, give me all the objects with a height greater than the width uh, and internally do that referencing. That's one of the things that's coming as part of that aggregation refactor. Yes, it's true. I forgot that. Yeah. yeah. Um, since there's no one else asking questions, I'll, I'll ask just to bake the bear and wave this nice little bag of Patagonian <laughs> mindbender weed to see exactly what we can get out of this. How much like SQL does the back end have to be in order to build a back end? Um, where does the back end start? Yeah, we're, well, OK. <laughs> and I suppose that's the, we're, we're talk, we've been talking, obviously, uh, you know, Bigtable has GQL, which is kind of, if you look the right way, like SQL. We were having conversations yesterday about LDAP. How far, how far can you go in terms of a data store and still have something that could be wrapped in a query set? <clears throat> OK, with, with changes. Let's assume two obvious pieces of, of internal code are fixed. For something like, let's, let's talk about, say, an LDAP backend, very non-SQL-like, essentially a tree of, of tuples of data. You have to, you'd have to replace the query class. So you'd have to make something that had a lot of the public, the internal, external APIs of the query class, but you wouldn't have to replace query set. Um, and in fact, you might not even have to go too far, but the query class understands about tables and table joins and things like that. Like that's pretty much its reason for existence is to manage table joins and column names. That doesn't make sense with something like LDAP. With something like Bigtable, it probably does. Well, this gets worse and worse. Um, so you'd have to replace the query class there. Um, for GQL, again, we ha the two things that have to be fixed there, I have to add some stuff to related um, fields, and I have to remove some SQL fragments from related.py. But apart from that, we're very close to just replacing query. Sir? Um, yeah, my question is about uh, polymorphic queries. Seems like a lot of people request them, and sometimes it might be considered, uh, I don't know, maybe controversial. But it, it, it seems like it might be possible using the content types contrib app to keep it, track of the model hierarchies. It's, it's possible. Is so the, que the question here is, I guess, when you do model inheritance, let's suppose you smoke that weed and <laughs> you, you want to query the base class and get the child object back, and it could be one of any number of chi children. Because one of the design requirements is you can subclass third-party models, which means you, don't you can't change the table of these models because you may not even have permission to do so, um, how do you descend to the right, how do you know the right child? Yes, you can certainly do it by going through content. If you had a table that mapped for every ID in the parent table, the content type and ID of the most derived child table, you could do it. There's no reason not to do that externally. Um, it's going to take an awful lot of convincing to convince me to put that in Django. You might be happy with someone else, but it's just it's something that we had a bunch of conversations a couple of years ago, particularly as a thread on Django Dev that Russell and I are basically in violent agreement. It took us about four males to realize we were completely agreeing that this wasn't a good idea for step one, because there's a lot of extra overhead for something that you probably shouldn't be doing in the first place. If you've got a hierarchy like that, put the type ID. If you control the parent, put the type ID in the parent. Right. Well, I mean, that, that's what I do when I smoke that particular weed. But uh, it, it seems to be a common enough uh, answer to the question. Well, but it's not really common. It's like 15 people out of 10,000 <laughs> want to do it, OK? <laughs> it's don't confuse a couple of dozen people with a lot. Of, like, I, yes, I realize people who want to do it can't see any reason not to do it, but it's an awful lot of code that has a lot of fragility in it that you can actually do externally, so it's not worth doing at the moment. Someone should come up with a very solid implementation that's like 100 lines of code and say, look, no bugs, dedicated audience, I'll put it in. Till that happens, 
Mm, not on my list. Fair enough. Thanks. Mr. Holovadi. Well, you want to go? How about uh, update only writing fields that have changed? Update it, yes. Okay, there's two update things actually that we, we want to do. Updating only the columns that have changed, which is a little risky, but is also possible in certain cases. That has some overhead because we have to track which fields have actually changed. Um, and there are certain fields types where that's a little bit expensive. And there's a bit of a trade off there as to how expensive is it to track that given how common you're actually going to want to do that. For example, if you've got a very big text field, working out whether it's changed, so you've got a computer hash or something, that's non-zero amount of time every single time you load that model. So there's a bit of public API that needs to be worked out there. The other one, before anyone asks, is select for update is something that we actually want to put in because it's very necessary. We've got to get the error handling right there. If someone goes select for update and locks a row in the table, the equivalent, the Python equivalent of the SQL select for update locks a row in the table and then does something stupid. They do this in the middleware saying, don't unlock the row. No one else can access that row all through the view. That could be very, very hard to debug. We're working on the, the error handling there and trying to work out how to stop people shooting other people in the foot. Adrian. So here's a feature that a couple of other ORMs have that I've been thinking about as, as a nice thing. And I don't think I ever asked your, your opinion on it. So say you have 50 columns in your table. Right now, there's no way in the Django ORM to say, yeah, usually 90% of the time, I only want to select these 10 and sort of like uh, make the other ones lazily loaded. Yeah, I, I, I have code for this. It just didn't make the feature cut for 1.0. Oh. You've opened a ticket. I actually have code that does it, but it's not 100% stable yet. So it didn't make the feature cut for 1.0. Is this guy awesome? <laughs> Seriously. And, and you can do the revert. You can basically say, um, Adrian wanted to call the API hidden. And this is why we don't let Adrian design APIs very often, because these fields aren't hidden. You can actually view them. <laughs> so it's probably going to be called defer. But you basically specify the columns that you want to defer until later. And then when you access that attribute, it looks up. We're also going to, and here I don't know what to call it, but something like um, only load or something that you specify just the columns you want to load rather than the columns you want to ignore. So we have two versions. Because if you've got 50 columns and you only want to load five of them, it's probably a little stupid to say, ignore these other 45. You might as well just say, accept these five. But yeah, it's 1.1 maybe, probably. Do we have time for one more? This is a quick question, then we'll get back OK, so the question is, yeah, what I, I, I heard his question. I'll just repeat it. The question was, what, what support is there for supporting multiple databases within the same database server um, rather than necessarily different database servers? It's basically the same problem to a, to a certain extent. A connection at the Python DB level is to a database, not to a necessarily to a server. Like A database includes server address slash location and name. So it's basically the DSN string is the connection. Um, so multiple databases on the same server, on different servers, on different continents is the, exactly the same problem. Um, schema support, I guess, is the real question you should be asking about for something like Oracle. And schema support is, someone's actually working on this, and Russell's making his life difficult by making him do it properly. Um, so we'll actually probably get pretty solid schema support in at some point um, as well. There's a bit of bike shedding to do there about what do we call various meta attribute names and stuff like that. Cool. OK. Uh, thank you, Malcolm.